Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 350th episode... The long-awaited milestone. (laughs) Sure. In another 15 episodes, we'll have one for every day of the year. Oh. Also a fun milestone. I was thinking, because we've talked about this particular episode for a few weeks now. Oh, that's true. Yeah. (laughs) So as we mentioned in previous episodes, it's all about hadrosaurs. Hadrosaurtastic. It is. So we're going to kick it off with an interview with Albert Prieto Marquez, who is one of the leading names in hadrosaur research. And then we'll get into the dinosaur of the day, which is sort of Trachodon slash Anatosaurus. But it's really about all of the other lumpings. And splittings. Of hadrosaurus. (laughs) Yeah, because I guess you can't have lumping without splitting. Yep. And then at the end, we'll have news. We're sort of switching it around since we're starting with the interview. So the news is just going to be the same as the fun fact, which is about a hadrosaur with some paleopathologies, also known as fossilized injuries, which is pretty interesting. In case you haven't had your fill of hadrosaurs by then. Yes, all hadrosaurs. But before we get into all of this hadrosaur goodness, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have a new patron to thank, and that's the Howard family. Thank you all so much for joining our Patreon. We already had a little bit of a fun discussion on our Patreon. So we appreciate you joining. And then rounding out the shout outs, we got Remy Rodriguez, Melina and Manoli, JC, Bill Jago, Quinn Pomeroy, Risa, Ellen, Stefan, and Greg. Yeah, thank you so much. We would not have made it to 350 episodes without your support and the support of our other patrons. So if you want to join our growing community, maybe get in on some, I'm sure there will be some hadrosaur discussions in the Discord after this, then go to our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. So as promised, with our switcheroo on the order, we're kicking it off with our interview. We are joined this week by Albert Prieto Marquez, who is a PhD researcher at the Catalan Institute of Paleontology. And we're talking to him today because he's one of the world's leading experts on hadrosaurs. And this episode's all about hadrosaurs, so we had to talk to him. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So starting out with an easy question, because I've been wondering how people that study hadrosaurs feel about this. What do you think of the term duckbill to describe hadrosaurs? Uh, I think it's cute. I mean, <laughs> uh, and it's actually sort of uh, accurate. I mean, they are very far from that in terms of relationship, but they have a, a structure which resembles a beak, actually. So in the in front of the mouth, both the upper, say the upper beak mm-hmm. and the lower one, and it actually it does look like a duck bill. So. What else are you going to tell them? (laughs) If you you don't want to get into the technicalities, I think it basically describes to the the layman what these animals would look like. That and also the crests that they usually have on the top of their their heads. Mm. Most species. So those those two things, actually, what would define these animals like from outside without actually getting into the details and all that. That's good. I noticed because hmm. yesterday we were describing some dinosaurs to some people in our family who aren't as familiar with the terms. And first he said hadrosaur and they weren't sure what we were talking about. And then we said duckbill and I said, oh, yes, we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know some people don't like the term because they're like, well, the, it's not so ducky because it sort of closes in a little bit more. And it's more, you know, like the, the beak overlaps a little more than a duckbill would yeah. and things like that. But it's nice to hear that you like it. So maybe we'll go back to using it more because we say hadrosaur and people don't always know what we mean. Yeah, this is the, the thing that if I'm talking to members of my family or people who are not into paleontology even. If I want to just in a few words to convey the image I think, what else are you going to call them? <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Unless you're talking about Parasaurolophus, then you say like the, the yeah. one with the huge thing sticking off the back of its head. <laughs> right, yeah. Cool. So I've also been curious if you have an opinion on what adaptations hadrosaurs had to make them so successful in the late Cretaceous. Yeah, and probably they had to do with the feeding mechanism. So actually they have hundreds of teeth, both in the upper and lower jaws. Mm-hmm. And some species may have more than a, a couple thousand teeth <laughs> in, the, in the entire mouth. Wow. A species that are 
kind of outside the group, but they are sort of a ancestral. They are really show the trend to adding more teeth to their mouths. And then you get to the hadrosauridae, which is the quote unquote hadrosaurs. And then they get an explosion of species and they all show like a great increase in the number of teeth. Like at least 30, more than 30 tooth rows mm -hmm. on each side. So it would be like 30 on the left side of the lower jaw and another 30, you know, from front to back yeah. tooth families. And also if you go deep into the jaws, you will find more, more teeth. <laughs> at least four or five stack one on top of the other. And those teeth would uh, push up. So they, the old ones, the, the, the worn ones would be shed. And then new ones will be growing up. That's amazing. Which is something that happens actually, you know, the dinosaurs, the, what I mean, the having multiple teeth throughout their, their lives. And uh, like us, as you know, we have only two. <laughs> yeah, we get you stuck. Know, you had the, the milk ones and then we had the dots. No, the dinosaurs, they had plenty of them throughout life. But then hadrosaurs, they have just a, a huge number of teeth filling their, their jaws at one time. So they were they were able to chew basically also yeah which is something that I think horn dinosaurs you no know, ceratopsians they were also able to do they also have very complex we call those things I mean the stacking of teeth we call that dental batteries mm -hmm. so those those two groups like uh, ceratopsids and then hadrosaurs were able to have all this complexity in their mouth and probably this was a key factor in their success I think. That's cool. Does that tell us anything about what they ate? They, they could tell us something about the type of plants. So we actually work by my former supervisor, Gregory Erickson, who is a professor at uh, Florida State University in Tallahassee. He has done some work on the macro structure of those teeth, every individual tooth. He found that those teeth are really complex. You have up to six different types of tissues. You know that we have like an enamel and two or three more tissues. But those uh, hadrosaurs had even more types. <laughs> and then he was able to differentiate different types of chewing surface of the entire jaw. So there are differences in how steep the, those surfaces are and also how concave or how flat they are. So those things may tell us uh, something about whether the plants were very, very coarse or not, or whether they were slicing or they were more like grinding and slicing or just grinding. And then about the type of plants, the most interesting evidence is coming from the stomach contents. Yeah. Hmm. The stomach, quote unquote, because the stomach is gone, of course, but you've had some specimens where you find some remains of fossil plants. Mm -hmm or seeds also in the area where the stomach would be found. Yeah. So is there anything that they had as like a favorite food? We, I don't think we, we can pinpoint so much detail. Uh, mostly in conifers, mm. things like that. Maybe some angiosperms, perhaps, which were already pretty, pretty common at the time. I'm talking about the last 20, 25 years, million years of the Cretaceous. So we had a lot of uh, flowering plants at the time already. Yeah, it was kind of, I know that sometimes they're linked to the evolution of angiosperms. No, some, some studies show that actually there is no correlation between the radiation of angiosperms and that of these mega herbivores. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the statistical data and some analysis doesn't support that. Cool. So then it's just... Mm -hmm that their teeth were way more efficient for whatever they Probably. were trying to eat. Yeah. Cool. So since you study dinosaur radiation too, do you have any mm. thoughts on whether or not dinosaurs or maybe more specifically hadrosaurs were declining in diversity prior to the mass extinction? There are papers. I mean, every now and then there gets a new paper that mm -hmm. goes one way or the other because I've been involved in studies saying that no, that they were not declining, but I think there is a recent study, maybe it's a month old only, saying that the dinosaurs actually were, as a whole, declining before the impact. And I remember in 2012, with with some colleagues, uh, again, Steve Berusati from the University of Edinburgh, and other colleagues, we published a paper saying that it's difficult to talk about dinosaurs as a, as a block, that every group experienced a different type of evolution 
when you approach the end of the Mesozoic era. And then hadrosaurs were doing quite well when you consider the world as a whole, because it changes also. For, for example, if you look at North America, the last 20 million years, you know, it was split by a Western interior seaway. So you had the continent to the west that we call Garamidia. And then you have Apagatia to the east. So then at that time, you see like a decrease in species. Mm. And you go from in the Campanian, so you get like uh, five, six, seven, eight species then. And when you reach the Maastrichtian, which is the gas stage, there is only Edmontosaurus. <laughs> and I think, so there is a decrease in the in number of species. But then you look at Russia at the same time, at the, in, at the end of the Cretaceous, and you see many different species mm. at the very end. We call it the, the uppermost Maastrichtian, which is about 66, 67 million years ago very close to the end. And there you find different species. And also here in Europe, too. We have five or six already. Gotcha. Mm. So it depends on the area. Yeah, it's much more complex. It's a North American bias to say there were less hadrosaur species at the end Maybe, of the Cretaceous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, yeah, at Hell Creek there were, but that's not the whole world. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but everybody just focuses on Hell Creek, it seems like. <laughs> so how'd you get started working on hadrosaurs? Uh, so that was when I arrived to the, the, the Museum of the Rockies because of my master's. That was 21 years ago already. So then uh, I wasn't too clear what I was going to be working on. So Jack Horner, you know, famous dinosaur paleontologist, was my supervisor. And it was him, actually, who offered me to study a beautiful uh, Brachiofosaurus, mm. skeleton. Actually, it was completely articulated. Wow. Pristine preservation. And there was also remains from at least four individuals from a bone bed from the same area. So he kind of invited me to study all that my material for my master's. So I had, uh, it was amazing because I had these articulated bones that you usually don't see in 3D like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You sometimes you see them in an articulated skull if you're lucky. <laughs> but over there we had amazing preservation and I had the skull completely articulated in one individual and then I had all the different bones apart from different individuals so it was perfect. That is nice. Yeah because like many people I guess I was fascinated by theropods Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so first I thought I think I want to work on theropods but then when I saw that and Jack was kind enough to offer me to work on this amazing material I was like yeah I think I'll do do hard (laughs) stuff. I went on from there yeah and once I knew a little bit about that particular species, I wanted to know about the entire group, which is why in my PhD I decided to try to put together phylogeny to figure out how they related to each other, but to include as many species as, as possible. Mm-hmm. There are a lot to include. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, every, every few months there, there are new ones coming up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, ornithopods don't get the love. They're very similar to theropods in a lot of way, but everybody wa- always wants hmm. to talk about theropods. Ornithopods are cool too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you have any favorite details about hadrosaurs? Like, it, was there anything about them that made you really interested in them when you were looking at that Brachylophosaurus? I think I was fascinated about the anatomy itself mm-hmm. as a, a structure. As I, as I got to know more about it, I started to recognize details that made me more curious about questions about the way they evolved and the way they became so successful. But it was nothing a priori, actually. Gotcha. It was once I got, I got into the study, and once you know more about something, then you want to know even more. Mm-hmm. And it becomes a little bit, uh, a bit, of, a bit of uh, obsession because, I mean, there were so many other species around in, in that museum. It was amazing. So you start comparing, let's say, the dentary or the, the jaws of this species with the jaws of another species, and you start seeing differences. They may tell you how they relate to each other. Yeah. So that really sparked a lot of interest to keep digging deeper. 
that definitely is like us. We the more we learn about dinosaurs, yeah. the more we want to learn about mm-hmm. dinosaurs. The more questions. Yeah, we yeah. Have. It's self. It's a self feeding process, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and it's nice that there's so many being discovered. Yeah. <laughs> when we first started, we were worried that we would run out of topics, and it's like no, mm-hmm. there's never too, there's almost too many <laughs> topics to cover. Every week we have to decide what we're not going to talk about. That oh yeah. <laughs> And and also because hadrosaurs is one of the dinosaur groups for which we have more material, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so you can approach questions about life history or ontogeny. Yeah, more biological things that with other groups you are more li- limited because of the fossil record. Mm-hmm. So that was interesting. With your thesis. Because I'm I'm actually reading it for the episode as well. But see how good your memory wow. is from 21 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I know. You're make I him know. defend his thesis. A no, 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 <laughs> not defend. Just <laughs> I'm just curious in terms of um, when you're going through the phylogeny. Like, were there ever any cases? Maybe you don't have that many bones, but the one bone that you have does have a unique characteristic. And then how do you decide? Like, okay, this is enough. Like, it can stay its own genus or no, that's not enough. We need to, I don't know, come back to this later. No, well, this is it's simple because there is not a hadrosaur in the world that, that has it. Oh. But then that's why I decided to just try to see every, no, everything impossible. No, But in three, almost almost four years I spent traveling, mm-hmm. I wanted to actually see firsthand as much material as possible. So then when I see some new element in maybe here in the Pyrenees or in other parts of the world, I have a huge database of, and a huge archive of photographs from maybe 80% of all the species. Oh, wow. No? So then I can be sure that what I have is unique. Mm-hmm. And then I complement that with uh, papers that have been published over the last few years. Because, of course, since I finished my dissertation, there have been new species, and I kept traveling as much as I could mm-hmm. since then. But the pace of the discoveries has increased. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to keep up and with. And it's almost like exponential. <laughs> right. I think there is more, more people working today in vertebrate paleontology than ever, and it keeps increasing. Mm-hmm. So it's really hard to keep up with the pace of the new output of publications. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And hadrosaurs, too, you started with so much. Yeah. So much material. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like ankylosaurs where they're, they're four or five named in a year and it adds like 20% to the number of named <laughs> species. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to know that you have a new species, actually, it's quite simple, but sometimes it's, it's, not, it's not so simple to prove it. I mean, it's mm. simple when you know, okay, this character is unique at no other species in the world has it. Mm-hmm. But to reach to that point, you are, you need to be very convincing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And start taking measurements of everything you can and show that your new specimen doesn't fit with the measures or the angles that you take everything. It's really different. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's quite involved until you reach that point. And you need to make sure, does it come up a lot that people question whether it's like individual variation or uh, yeah, yes. paleopathology or one of those? Ontogeny. Yeah. Oh, yes. Taphonomy. All the time. Or maybe sometimes also it's very difficult that now we are discovering a new species, but it's based on sub-adults. Mm. So I, I need to show that these characters are not going to change in adults, between us, in sub-adults and adults. Mm-hmm. Some characters change and some don't. But most people will be very quick to say, oh, it's just a juvenile, so mm-hmm. you shouldn't use it. But they will throw everything like it's a juvenile. But, well, but you have to see which traits are going to change and which are maintained. So yeah, if you know this trait is going to be also found in the adult, then yeah, you can name it based on that. Yeah. And there are tons of dinosaurs where all we have is juveniles. Then what are you going <laughs> to... Right. <laughs> they can be really mm-hmm. unique. Are you going to not name it? Wait till you find the adult yeah. someday? <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes you have no choice but to, but to wait. But if you think like we think now, we have some bones that actually are, we call that diagnostic. Mm-hmm. So that they have unique characters. And then, but we, we need to prove that even though it's a juvenile, we because of the knowledge we have for other species, where we have a, a series, you know, like a, uh, we call it ontogenetic series, like a Mayasora, mm-hmm. Hepacrosora, Stevingerae, uh, Encoritosaurus, Casuarius. So in those cases, we can refer to those instances where 
where we have a very complete ontogenetic series and then use that as a, as a, a reference to know what should we expect the morphology to become from juvenile to adult. Yeah. So for example, if I see that my, I have a bone, like a cheekbone, no? that tells me about the size of the orbit. And I see, oh, it's huge. But then we know that in juveniles, the orbit is huge. So mm-hmm. we, we shouldn't use that as a, as a character because it's going to change in adults and it's a juvenile trait. But then there are other things, but maybe it's constant. Where's a more constant spot in the bones? In the postcrania. Yeah, there are some. Mm. So, for example, the hum- humerus, mm. it has a pretty... I don't want to start throwing names, but there is like a, a crest mm-hmm. that expands. It, it's sort of like a... Um, is it the deltopectoral? Yes, <laughs> right, the deltopectoral crest. So it's basically like a thick lamina that sticks out of the shaft of the bone. Mm-hmm. So this is very prominent from the neonates. Maybe not as much as in the adult, but when you compare more ancestral taxa, even in juvenile versus juvenile, is not as prominent and in the hadrosaurids. Oh, that's mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, things are gray. I don't know, black or white. Mm-hmm. So these, these papers where we're naming things, we really need to go into detail of what can be used, what cannot be used, and why. And then citing all the different specimens and everything. Was that the... Because you named that a dynamosaurus which was the uh, weak yeah. shoulder lizard. Did that have less right. of that delto pectoral crest? Is that what made it a, a weak shoulder? No, that, that has to do with the scapula, which oh. is the, sh- the, the shoulder blade. And then what happens is that in all the hadrosaurids, this scapula has a, a blade that becomes wider as you go towards the back. But then in this adenomosaurus, it didn't become wider. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, most people would say, what if it's a, a juvenile, even though it was not a small scapula, but people could argue maybe it's not wide enough because it's not an adult. But here comes the, all the data from other species. Now there are evidence of almost baby scapula that also show this expansion, <laughs> even in the babies. So then you can use that to say, no, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It would be expanded also even if it was a juvenile. Yeah. That is interesting. The only way to know, too, which bones are going to be unique is just by looking at all of them, because you'd never guess yeah. if this muscle attachment point would be like on a baby already. <laughs> so mm-hmm. big. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is always a chance that we're going to get it wrong. Mm-hmm. Because with having a few scraps of bone, as happens here in the Pyrenees, you do the best you have with the data you have at the moment, but you know that it just takes another discovery, just a single other bone to throw your most recent work <laughs> but that's yeah. part of science, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, you you could be spending twenty years waiting for a more complete specimen, yeah, yeah. But that we may never find. So there is this is something that some people would argue. If you want to be very very strict, you will have to wait. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then this is the problem that this is the the not so nice part that as a academics we need to put out productivity. We mm-hmm. cannot sit and wait for 50 years. Mm-hmm. You really need to... Got to publish. Yeah. Got to publish or, <laughs> or, or perish, no? But this is true for all the sciences. No? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so some people, I have some colleagues that would say, you are too fast. You should wait. You should be more careful. I'm like, well, the data have he has, is telling me this. So mm-hmm. I'm just going to head and let the, the world know about this. And if we are wrong, we can write a new paper saying that we were wrong. Yeah, mm-hmm. which has happened before, actually, and it's okay. Well, it's probably helpful too because you you've got something out there, and then people can build on your work and use that yeah. as the starting point for their work, and goes on. Yeah, definitely good to publish it some way. But then, yeah, sometimes you have one bone that is really bizarre, mm-hmm. and one could argue, what if it's a pathology? How how, how do you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have any signs of overgrowth or you know things that tells you that. The bone was broken and rehealed. I mean, it could still be an anomaly mm-hmm. that that individual, but you don't know. Mm-hmm. So you just, I guess you just take the plunge and say, okay, I mean, at face value, this is a trait that is different. That's yeah. it. That's what you can say with all the data I have. So, but of course, some people are very conservative and very careful would say, yeah, but you don't know the other side of the body. So maybe that's an anomaly and the other side is just like the normal one. So this will never end. 
because of the nature of the data is uh, is crappy sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Was that, I'm trying to remember, I have a list of a couple of the dinosaurs you named recently. You have Phylax, I think is your most recent one. Mm, uh, for which one? For Phylax. Ah, f- Phylax. Ah, oh, yeah, Phylax. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to write that down so I get it right. <laughs> I guess. I think it was Latin. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know Latin, so I don't really know. I would imagine it's E, but who knows? I'm not. It's just the way we pronounce it in Spain because the Ys and the Is are E. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate I that you say that, though, because we get all these pronunciation <laughs> corrections, and I'm like, we're talking to the guy who named it, and he says yeah. he's not <laughs> sure how to name it. So how do you know how to say it? <laughs> was there anything cool? That one was right by the KPG boundary, right? Yeah, very, very close to the very end. So that was a, a specimen found in the 90s here, and the first paper came out in 1999, and they were right. It was like a hadrosauroid. So this is uh, sort of like an ancestral form. And so it's a more inclusive group that includes hadrosaurids and then other species that are outside. And this is one of them. And then it's a very robust dentary and it has that, we call it coronoid process. So I don't want to get too (laughs) technical, but if you see like a jaw, it has that that thing sticking up. So Mm -hmm. you have the main body. And then there is a structure that is rising up from the back of the dentary. So we call that coronoid process. Mm-hmm. So there is a, the apex, the end is really robust and really white. So that's unique in these animals for something that strikes me. Gotcha. And it's at a pretty unique spot in time too. So you don't yes. have a lot of other things coexisting there. Actually, by that time, yeah. Most uh, species that belong to that grade evolutionary grade were extinct already. So this is the the youngest stratigraphically hadrosauroid, meaning it's not yet a, a hadrosaurid, but this one still survives all the way to the very <laughs> end. Maybe because uh, everything is going on in this island. It's really bizarre. <laughs> we find all kinds of things that maybe they were extinct already in other regions. Maybe they they got a refuge here, perhaps, we don't, we don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's always interesting when you have, because we do the same thing where we're like, well, it's more basal, which basically means like ancestral, but then it's mm-hmm. one of the most recent. So it's like a, a weird, <laughs> it gets hard to explain without using the technical term because it's yeah, it's all conflicted. <laughs> cool. So you mentioned your field work. Do you still do a lot of field work? Maybe not in the last year and a half, but do you right. still get out and do a lot of digging? In the, in the summers, this is the time where we usually go to the Pyrenees region. So actually right now, as we're speaking, my colleagues are probably finishing the day. I didn't join them this year because I was busy with paperwork and other things. Mm-hmm. But usually in June, July, this is when the entire July, because also this is when students have time, time mm-hmm. off after they finish their coursework and they can join us. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we can even remember have work on two or three different sites during the month and have different parties working in different sites. But here it takes really a lot of work and prospecting and searching to find anything. Mm. Gotcha. Is there anything unique about the sites other than is it just difficult because it's hard to find the bones because they're just more fragmentary? Well, it's just more basic. I mean, compared to the areas in Central Asia or North America, the area is rather small. So at this point, after de- decades of searching and, and field work, we are afraid that we may be running out of sites. So we are searching and searching and we find isolated bones. For example, we found a metatarsal that I'm actually, we are, we have a paper submitted that is in a re- review and this is going to be a little bit controversial. Because to put it simply, it's a hadrosauria that is trying to be a ipsilophodon. <laughs> because it's a really small and light animal, and all we have is a metatarsal four. But this yeah. is a really long bone. It's even longer than if you pick up a metatarsal four of a ipsilophodon. Mm-hmm. It's a very slender bone, and of course made for high speed. You know, we, we call it poor soil animal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this this bone has the same proportions, and it's as if you take a metatarsal of a hadrosaurid, and then you just stretch it, 
if you could do that, no, we can say when one is 3D software and you take a, a chunky large Hadrosaur metatarsal 4 and then you just stretch it and make it long, you will get this bone. <laughs> it has all the, 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 the features, the morphological features of a Hadrosaurid, but this is just stretched and made as, as, as render. And that's all we have. Yeah, that is going to be controversial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, I saw it is that this is a, a, a metatarsal of a Hadrosaurid, but it's trying to be something else. And we, we think it's a uh, really bizarre lineage that became adapted to cursoriality. Mm. Here, we don't know why. But also, it's part of the uh, island effect yeah. that it happens. You know, like in Romania, we had that dromosaurid that had a double sickle claw mm-hmm. instead yeah. of one. The <laughs> Bagaul Bondok, was called. Yeah. It's very bizarre. So here we're finding also a lot of bizarre things. And it's making our lives really hard <laughs> because it's very hard to compare with anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, mm, for example, we, th- we have now what we think is part of the, of the crest. It's just an isolated piece. But crests are unique in every species. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be pretty much impossible to compare with something similar because every species is doing their own thing. Mm-hmm. And if you have a part of a crest in an island with those bizarre morphologies, yeah. Well, we appreciate that you're finding the weirdos because we like the weird yes. dinosaurs. Yes, <laughs> the weirdos. That's a way, good way to put it, yes. <laughs> also, that they're finding titanosaur sauropods. Oh, nice. Oh. This is the, the, the most abundant. The, the hadrosaurs and the titanosaurs and some really nice discoveries also. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Do you have any other discoveries that you want to share or anything, any work that you're that you're able to share? Yeah, that you'd like ah, well, to share. So, so also, uh, aside from my work in the Pyrenees, I've been working for several years now in with material from Big Bend National Park, mm. with, with paleontology from Texas, from mm. Texas Tech University, and also from Big Bend itself. And in collections at the University of Texas in Austin, there are lots of material collected, I think, in the 1930s. Mm. And... Just by looking at everything that's there, we're coming up with new species. Sometimes we cannot, we are not able to identify if it's a new species or not, but we know this is a, there are different subgroups. And now we're working on a new species also from Big Ben, from the Companion. Oh, cool. Cool. It's a large one. And then with, we're looking at the biogeography of uh, Southern North America. So in also in connection with the material being found in Mexico. Nice. Because, you know, we know a lot of what's happening in the in the history of hydrosolids in the Western interior. Mm-hmm. We saw this classic taxa, but then these days people started to find more, more material in Utah, New Mexico, and moving south mm-hmm. in, in Texas also. Yeah. So try to put together the big picture from northern North America all the way to Mexico and also to Argentina. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah, those I really love those big papers that sort of pull it all together, especially yeah. with a complicated group like Hadrosaurus, mm-hmm. where there's so many. That seems to be your specialty. You take on these really large topics. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's a science because we have to incorporate a lot of ta- taxa that are poorly known, sometimes only from some post remains, but we try to put everything to have as much data as possible. Mm-hmm. So we have to be really try to squeeze the anatomy as much as possible to try to find as many as much data, try not to overlook anything. Yeah. And the, the other thing is that all these trees are prone to change. As long as you incorporate a new species, everything changes. Yeah. So all, all this, uh, you know, science is just a continuing progress. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't take anything as the ultimate truth, of course. It's just the best we have with the data we have. But maybe in one year or two, everything's going to change. We're yep. co- mm-hmm. seeing how everything is changing. Yeah. When we when we first started out, I had this dream of like compiling the the full tree of dinosaurs before I knew just oh, how yeah. impossible that was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like every paper that comes out, it's like, oops, this group shifted. We thought this thing was here for a hundred years and it turns out it's over in this other spot. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are used to that. It's perfectly normal. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the difficulty is to convey this to the public, the mm-hmm. general public, because they may see, okay, so what do we trust? These guys are always changing their hypothesis. Exactly. Yeah. So they understand that it's a, a state of flux. Yep. Mm -hmm. We like the flux. It keeps things interesting. (laughs) (laughs) It does. Oh, yeah. 
Cool. One last question for mm-hmm. our listeners. If they wanted to find out more about you and your work, is there a place online? Like, do you have a Twitter or something like that? So I don't have a, a Twitter, but they, they can check the web of the Katakan Institute of Pegontology. Mm. And there is my profile over there, too, along with the other members of the Dinosaur Ecosystems group also. Great. Or there, there is a, a Facebook link to the other work we're doing in, in the Pyrenees. Oh, cool. It's been posted also in the web of the, of the Catalan Institute of Pedontology, which has sort of like a news page also. And then on, on Facebook, there is a page also from the museum in the Pyrenees, which is in a small town called Isona. I'll have to make sure it's on our map. I think I found that one recently. I love finding the small dinosaur museums. And then when we travel, we try to make it out to as many as we can. So cool. And like you said, sometimes they have tons of fossils that are on display. Yeah, I mean, that museum in Isona... Is uh, undergoing renovation. Mm. Mm. I think they're, they're supposed to be finishing in a few months, and they're expanding the, the, the building and building new exhibits also. Nice. And putting a lot of materials, so that's going to be really nice. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That was an excellent conversation. You cleared up a lot of our had resort questions. Yes. Yeah, thanks for inviting <laughs> me. Thank you so much. That was really fun to talk about all the had resorts, and the discussion really helped me with. The, our dinosaur of the day or the rest of this episode. <laughs> and as always, we have an extended version of that interview for our patrons because this episode would be way too long if we left in the full interview. So if you're a patron and you're interested in hearing that, or if I guess you could join to hear it, then check out your custom RSS feed through Patreon. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, which as Garrett already explained it's more than one dinosaur it's actually around 50 or so (laughs) maybe a little more than 50 that's a lot because it's all hadrosaurs and specifically the request came from tyrant king via our patreon and discord a while back because i knew this was going to be a large one for trachodon anatosaurus and the other outdated lumpings of hadrosaurs but as we mentioned you can't really have lumpings without splittings so we're talking about those it's not all the hadrosaurs it's a lot (laughs) We've covered a lot of hadrosaur history in a few episodes, you know, just to get you started. If you wanted to go back to those, there's Edmontosaurus and Anatotitan in episode 129, Lambiosaurus in episode 148, and I'll be mentioning a lot more throughout this segment. And we also spent about three hours just on pronunciation for all these dinosaurs. So you may disagree with how we say it, but... We're doing our best. And in general, when there wasn't a good source material for how to pronounce it, we went with the closest thing that we can pronounce to what the original name origin is. So if there's a proper noun from Uzbekistan, for example, we looked up the Uzbek pronunciation and then tried to go with that method of pronouncing it. But then it gets Latinized and then our English version of it. So it's always going to be a little different. Mm -hmm. But we're doing our best. (laughs) Yes. All right. So diving into the hadrosaurs. Again, this will be a lengthy segment. <laughs> Hadrosaurs, as most of us already know, they're known as the duck-billed dinosaurs. They're the herbivores with dental batteries and they're facultative bipeds, so they could stand on two legs, but oftentimes they were on four. I'm going to start with an excerpt from Hadrosaurs' Life of the Past, which was published in 2014. There's 36 chapters of Hadrosaurs, and it was a result of an international Hadrosaur symposium in 2014. They had 50 over 50 presentations that, quote, rounded out two days of hardcore hadrophilia. (laughs) Hadrophilia. And says, quote, In recent years, a number of dinosaur groups have been the subject of renewed scientific interest. In 2005, sauropod studies experienced a scientific renaissance with the benchmark publications The Sauropods, Evolution in Paleobiology, and Indiana University Press's Thunder Lizards, The Sauropodomorph Dinosaurs. In 2010, after a decade-long surge of interest in horned dinosaurs, the group received similar treatment in Indiana University Press's new perspectives on horned dinosaurs. During the last five years, it has been the hadrosaur's time in the spotlight. Nice. So, uh, kind of setting the stage here with the hadrosaurs. There are a lot of papers around Trachodon and Anatosaurus and other individual hadrosaurs. A lot of the papers are by Albert Prieto Marquez. As we said, he's a leading hadrosaur expert but we'll get into source material at the end of this segment. Most hadrosaurs are identified from their skulls. In 1989, Michael Keith Brett Sermon wrote a revision of Hadrosauridae and their evolution and reviewed 48 hadrosaurs. 
He found a decline in diversity in number, which had nothing to do with lumping or splitting, and found that hadrosaurid postcrania do have differences. They don't all look alike. The bodies don't look exactly the same. <laughs> if you spend enough time staring at hadrosaur skulls, you start to notice a difference. These are the skulls. This is the bodies. Because Peter Dodson, in 1975, was a graduate student of John Ostrom. He was looking at hadrosaur skulls, the crania, and published on lambiosaurine craniums, which was then carried on by Jack Horner and his students. So Brett Sermon decided to look at the post crania mm. so as not to, you know, overstep. He cataloged 500 specimens based on photos, personal observations, and literature, and named the new genus from it Anatotitan. He also compared hadrosaurines and lambiosaurines and found that hadrosaurine scapula, the blade, was relatively longer and not as wide compared to lambiosaurines. And an example of that is Brachylophosaurus. He also found that because hadrosaurines of very old age therefore tend to mimic lambiosaurines morphologically, very large or old hadrosaurines represented by postcranial remains without skulls may be misidentified and assigned to the lambiosaurines. And this can lead to taxa assigned to the lambiosaurines at the expense of hadrosaurines. And that was a quote. At the expense of hadrosaurines. <laughs> They're not getting their time in the limelight because the lambiosaurians are getting the credit. I guess. <laughs> I guess that's one way to read it. <laughs> then Albert Prieto Marquez, in his 2008 thesis, worked over four years where he went to 12 countries on four continents and he got 78,000 images of thousands of hadrosaur specimens from 47 institutions, something like 56 species. And he wrote, quote, hadrosaurids were the most diverse and abundant dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous. So again, we'll be covering something like 50 hadrosaurs. They will be listed in the show notes, but I won't be reading them because that would just be a long list of names. <laughs> but we are going to go through all of them. Yes. So our friend, Edward Drinker Cope of the Bone Wars, named the family Hadrosauridae in 1869 with two species, Hadrosaurus mirabilis, also known as Trachodon mirabilis, and Hadrosaurus fulci. In 1888, Lidecker ignored Hadrosauridae and created Trachodontidae, which included Hadrosaurus, Orthomerus, and Diclonius. Then, Lawrence Lamb in 1918 said, Trachodontidae was invalid and resurrected Hadrosauridae, which had been named earlier, and he also preferred Hadrosaurus as the type genus instead of Trachodon because Hadrosaurus had more, better preserved fossils, and he thought that Trachodon was dubious. It wasn't diagnostic enough, not enough unique characters. Hmm. Albert Prieto Marquez pointed out that until the mid-1980s with cladistic methods, quote, scientists were subjectively biased in their criteria for establishing taxonomic units and hypotheses of evolutionary relationships, end quote. Like when in 1922, Park said that Parasaurolophus was a close relative of Saurolophus based on the shape of the crest, but they're classified in two different subfamilies now. So in addition to a lot of lumping and splitting of hadrosaur genera and species, there was a lot of back and forth around hadrosaur families. So where they sat in the family trees, in other words? Even the names of the family trees. Oh, wow. It didn't help that a lot of hadrosaur teeth were found early on without much skeletal material, so that also led to confusion. But anyway, we're going to start with Trachodon, since that and Anatosaurus are the main requests, but they get mixed up with a lot of other hadrosaur names, and this happens a lot. So we'll be talking about hadrosaurs that have been kind of talked about together. In other words, this will not be in alphabetical order. It'll be based on how they're connected. So Trachodon. Trachodon was a dubious hadrosaurid based on teeth found in the Judith River Formation in Montana in the U.S., the genus name means rough tooth and refers to the, quote, granulate inner surface of one of the teeth. So we're starting off strong with a <laughs> dinosaur named after a tooth. Yeah, always a good way to go. The teeth that were found came from hadrosaurids and ceratopsids, turned out. Ceratopsids had this distinct double root. And uh, this description ended up being the first description of a ceratopsid. <laughs> Accidentally. Yep. Not the only time hadrosaurs get confused with ceratopsid. Joseph Lady, who described the teeth, eventually saw the difference after describing hadrosaurus and then suggested only the double root teeth, which are actually the ceratopsian teeth, be referred to trachodon. In 1853, Ferdinand Hayden 
had collected teeth and fossils along the Missouri River and then sent them to Lady to describe. And at the time, Hayden was only 24 years old. He was a student exploring the Badlands. And apparently he got the nickname Man Who Picks Up Stones Running from the Sioux because he collected fossils so quickly. <laughs> That's a pretty good nickname. Yeah. So the type species is Trachodon mirabilis. Lady described it in 1856. He described the teeth as very worn and in fragmentary condition. And as a side note, Lady also described Hadrosaurus foci, which we talked about in episode 202 in 1858, which had a lot more of the skeleton. And some paleontologists thought that Hadrosaurus and Trachodon may be the same, but they didn't have the skull. So they didn't know about it, you know, being the duckbill type of dinosaur. They thought it was like a guanodon. Lowell Wright published a monograph on hadrosaurs in the 1940s, and they thought that the roughness of the tooth that led to Trachodon's name was because the tooth wasn't used. The species name, Mirabilis, means marvelous in Latin. And so Trachodon's based on seven unassociated teeth. The bone wars also didn't help in terms of it made a lot of things confusing. And at one point, all known hadrosaur species were considered to be Trachodon, except for Cleosaurus agilis. Other species included Trachodon amarens, which was named in 1925 based on a partial skeleton found in China and is now considered to be Manchurosaurus. There's also Trachodon cantabrigiensis, which was named in 1888 by Lidecker based on a tooth found in England, but now that's considered to be a nomum dubium. There's Trachodon longiceps, which was named in 1897 by Marsh based on a large right dentary with teeth found in the Lance Formation of Wyoming in the U.S., then later assigned to Anatotitan, and it's now a nomum dubium. Trachodon marginatus, which was named in 1902 by Lamb, based on disassociated skeletal material that later became Stephanosaurus marginatus, and then it was referred to Critosaurus by some. Then there was Trachodon solani, named in 1902 by Lamb based on a dentary with teeth found in the Dinosaur Park Formation of Alberta that became Teropelix and then became a Nomum Dubium. So there's a lot of dentaries and teeth that got named different things and then later became Nomum Dubium. Yep. In 1915, Charles Gilmore wrote about Trachodon and said that Hatcher, back in 1902, he wrote this article titled The Genera and Species of the Trachodon Today. Hadrosauridae, Claysauridae, Marsh. It's an interesting title. Anyway, in that article, Hatcher said that the 10 genera of Trachodon today should be lumped into two, Trachodon and Claysaurus, which used to be Trachodon anectans, and the other eight should be synonyms of Trachodon. As a side note, we'll get to Claysaurus later, but he also said that Marsh's smaller Claysaurus agilis should be considered a valid genus. So Gilmore talked about the fragmentary teeth being problematic for identifying and comparing other specimens. And he also said that he didn't think Trachodon was from the Lance Formation. Not many teeth were found there compared to the Judith River, Belly River, and Two Medicine Formations. He said that Trachodon was based on specimens from the Judith River Formation, and those specimens have a smaller number of teeth, so Trachodon could only be from the Judith River Formation. And he said that this meant that the trachodonts from the Lance Formation did not belong to a genus and that meant that one of the older dinosaur names should be revived. Charles Sternberg compared the holotype, the teeth of Trachodon mirabilis, to other hadrosaurids in 1936 and found they were most like lambiosaurines. In 2016, Albert Prieto Marquez and others named Eotrachodon orientalis to honor Trachodon. The genus name means Don Rufftooth from the east, and it was a primitive hadrosaur found in Alabama in the U.S. and lived about 10 million years before Parasaurolophus and Lambiosaurus. And we've actually talked about Trachodon before, specifically the Trachodon mummy, in our episode about Edmontosaurus in episode 129, because the Trachodon mummy is now considered to be Edmontosaurus. That Trachodon mummy is pretty amazing, which is what it's usually still called, even though it's definitely Edmontosaurus. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't say definitely. Nothing's ever definite. Right. <laughs> but most likely at Montezors. But that just shows you how much Trachodon has been split up Yeah. over the years. It's still a useful name because that mummy, which, you know, with the fossilized skin, basically, is such a unique specimen that it has its own name, essentially, at this point, calling it Trachodon. In terms of lumping and splitting, Diclonius mirabilis is a junior synonym of Trachodon. In 1988, Walter Combs Jr. wrote that Cope had named Diclonius based on isolated teeth, which wasn't enough. 
since hadrosaur teeth are too different based on individuals. And he wrote, Trachodon mirabilis is also a nomum dubium, although the name may be used in historical but not taxonomic discussions. And he said that Anatosaurus cobi, which was originally Diclonius mirabilis, was valid but was not necessarily referable to Anatosaurus. So that leads us into the next hadrosaur, Diclonius, which was a dubious hadrosaur, as you may have guessed from just now. <laughs> it lived in the late Cretaceous. It was found in the Judith River Formation in Montana. It was named in 1876 by Cope based on one tooth. Then later Cope referred other teeth. And the genus name, Diclonius, means double sprout because it refers to how it replaced teeth, where replacement teeth could be used at the same time as older, more worn teeth. These teeth were double sprouted compared to monoclonius. They used one set of teeth at a time, and that's monoclonius was named in the same paper by Cope. The type species is Diclonius pentagonis, which, because it's based on teeth, is considered a nomum duium. In 1942, Lull and Wright republished Cope's descriptions, but they couldn't find the type specimens in the American Museum of Natural History collections. Another nail in the coffin, mm -hmm. if it being based on teeth wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And after looking at Cope's descriptions, they found that this species may have been a ceratopsian. But they thought that Cope was misled with a ceratopsian tooth that was included with the type specimen of Trachodon mirabilis, because there's no ceratopsian tooth fragments in the type specimen of Diclonius per angulatus. But other teeth from Trachodon were still considered to be from a hadrosaur. So they said that Cope's descriptions were not enough, and they said Diclonius was, quote, open to question and doubtful, and some of it could be referred to Trachodon. According to Sternberg, Cope believed that Lady had abandoned Trachodon, so he named the species Diclonius and then referred Trachodon mirabilis to Diclonius in 1883 which is the same time he described a skull from the Lance Formation in South Dakota that he referred to Diclonius mirabilis, which had been found in 1882 by Cope and Hill. Poor old lady. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As he's known. <laughs> As he's known. We cover all of that in the Bone Wars episode 250. So some paleontologists at the time thought that the Judith River Formation and Lance Formation were from the same time period, which is probably why Cope referred the skull American Museum of Natural History labeled Cope's Diclonius mirabilis skeletal mount a trachodont skeleton because it was too unclear at the time. And then eventually it was relabeled to Anatotitan copi. And now it's considered a Montosaurus. Yes. The next dinosaur is Anatosaurus. Richard Swanlull and Nelda Wright published their monograph on hadrosaurs in 1942. We'll be bringing up their monograph a lot. They named Anatosaurus for the most common North American hadrosaur without a crest. The type species is Anatosaurus anectens. It's based on a partial skeleton and skull that Marsh had described as Claesaurus anectens in 1892. Anectens sure sounds familiar. Like Edmontosaurus? Mm hmm. Yeah. They made Cope's Diclonius mirabilis type specimen the type specimen for Anatosaurus copi. But in 1979, Anatosaurus was found to be too similar to Edmontosaurus regalis, which was named by Lawrence Lamb in 1917. So Anatosaurus anectens became Edmontosaurus anectens. It's interesting that the preference went to Edmontosaurus from 1917 and not Claesaurus from 1892. Maybe there was too much confusion over Claesaurus at that point. Yeah, it could be. Because you said Claesaurus had sort of been out of favor. Well, we'll get to Claesaurus. <laughs> Let me just finish up Anatosaurus real quick. So Anatosaurus copi became Anatotitan copi in 1990 because it was too different to be an Edmontosaurus. And just real quick, Anatosaurus lived in the Cretaceous and what is now North America. It browsed its food and cropped leaves and then wore them down with dental batteries, as many hadrosaurs do. And you can see Anatosaurus in the game Saurian. So now moving on, or moving back to Claesaurus, it was a primitive hadrosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous. It was herbivorous, probably walked on two legs and then stood on all fours to graze food. It was estimated to be 11 and a half feet or three and a half meters long and weigh about 1,050 pounds or 475 kilograms. It's a little guy. I guess. <laughs> yeah, for a dinosaur. And it had long legs, small arms, a long stiff tail, and a slender body. The type species is Claesaurus agilis, 
The genus name means broken lizard, and that refers to the way the fossils were found. It was originally named by Marsh in 1872, but as Hadrosaurus agilis. It was found in Kansas in the U.S., and they found partial skull fragments and an articulated postcranial skeleton. Gastroliths were thought to be found in Claysaurus, but it turned out to most likely be gravel that washed in after that specimen had died. It's always a very difficult thing to tell. When did those rocks get into the gut area? Yeah. Sometime between now and when it died tens of millions of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's exciting to think when you have a, something that was in the gut. So in 1890, it was renamed to Claysaurus agilis because it was found to be too different from Hadrosaurus. Marsh named Claysaurus anectens in 1892 based on two skeletons found in the Lance Formation, which then later became Anatosaurus and then Edmontosaurus. In 1903, Wyland named Claysaurus affinis based on fossils found in the Pierre Shale in South Dakota. And it was found along with fossils from a giant sea turtle. Turtles make our way into every episode, it seems. <laughs> Trying to make it seem like sauropods aren't the only ones found with turtles. Well, they're not. <laughs> I'm talking about hadrosaurs now. So the fossils, though, they got mixed up with Claysaurus agilis. And for a while, it was thought that only the toe bone remained of the type specimen for Claysaurus agilis. In 1948, Joseph Gregory found toe bones similar in size in the Yale collections that looked like it came from Pierre Shale, but didn't reassign the species. It was older in age and too fragmentary. Walter Coombs Jr. in 1988 said Claysaurus should be redefined based on something other than teeth characteristics. Seems to be a recurring theme with hadrosaurs. In 2004, Jack Horner and others found Claysaurus affinis to be dubious. And in 2008, Claysaurus agilis was found to be outside the clade with hadrosaurus and other hadrosaurids. It's the closest not hadrosaurid to true hadrosaurids within the clade hadrosauria. At least it was in 2008. <laughs> Good point. It's probably changed by now. Well, I didn't come across that while researching for this. Nobody else claimed that position? Not that I am aware of. Moving on, Thespesius, another dubious hadrosaurid that got mixed up with Edmontosaurus. It lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now South Dakota in the U.S. in the Lance Formation. Joseph Lady named it in 1856 based on two caudal vertebrae and a phalanx that Hayden had found in 1855 as part of that first paper about hadrosaurids. The type species is Thespesius occidentalis, and the genus name means wondrous one, and the species name means western. So it's this western wondrous one. Hmm. It was named because of the large size of the fossils. Hayden said that the bones came from a layer from the Miocene, so there was a chance it was a mammal, not a dinosaur. So that's why they didn't add a saurus to the name. <laughs> Interesting. In 1875, Cope said that he considered Agathalmus Milo, known from partial limb bones and some vertebrae, to be a synonym of the Thespesius occidentalis. Lucas suggested in 1900 that the original Thespesius fossils looked the same as more complete specimens of Claysaurus anectens and said they should all be Thespesius occidentalis because it had been named earlier. And Charles Gilmore agreed in 1915. He also pointed out that in 1902, Claysaurus anectens had been made a junior synonym of Thespesius occidentalis, but that this change was never acknowledged by paleontologists in subsequent work. Gilmore wrote, quote, while it cannot be positively demonstrated that Occidentalis and Anectins are identical, it is equally true that they cannot be shown to represent distinct species. Since the localities from which the type specimens came are not far apart geographically, it appears most probably, however, that they do represent one and the same species, end quote. So some people, such as Russell and Charles M. Sternberg, still use the names Thespesius Occidentalis or the Specius anectens for lance formation hadrosaurids during the 1920s and 1930s. In 1913, Lawrence Lamb said that the type specimen of the Specius occidentalis wasn't enough to be a valid genus. And then in 1942, Richard Lowell and now the Wright classified the Specius anectens as Anatosaurus copi, and they said the Specius occidentalis could maybe be different since it had shorter tail vertebrae, but they said the fossils were too incomplete. They couldn't do a good comparison. And since then, it's become a nomum dubium. In 1926, Sternberg named Thespesius 
Saskatchewanensis, but in 2011, Nicolas Campion and David Evans found it to be a synonym of Edmontosaurus annectans, and they also found that the species Edmontoni, which Gilmore named in 1924, was a synonym of Edmontosaurus regalis. So Edmontosaurus really wound up the real winner of a lot of these lumpings. Yes. That leads me to my next section on Edmontosaurus lumpings. Again, we've talked about Edmontosaurus in episode 129, but a quick recap. So Campion and Evans in 2011 looked at the skull growth and variation in Edmontosaurus, and they looked at 23 skulls from late Cretaceous dinosaurs in North America. That included Edmontosaurus regalis, the species Edmontoni, and Edmontosaurus saskatchewanensis. It's funny to have Edmontosaurus saskatchewanensis, since Edmonton is definitely not in Saskatchewan. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good point. (laughs) They said that, quote, individual variation and anatomical changes due to growth had led other researchers to name too many hadrosaurs from the pocket of late Cretaceous deposits they investigated, end quote. And they found that there were only two valid species of Edmontosaurus, Edmontosaurus regalis and Edmontosaurus annectans, and that there was a lot of taxa named on what turned out to be ontogenetic and individual variation. They said that the species Edmontoni was a junior synonym of Edmontosaurus regalis, and that Edmontosaurus regalis also included Anatosaurus edmontoni. And they said that Edmontosaurus saskatchewanensis and Anatotitan copi were Edmontosaurus anectans, because Edmontosaurus saskatchewanensis was a younger version, uh, the individual, of Edmontosaurus anectans, and Anatotitan copi was an older version of Edmontosaurus anectans. And they said that Edmontosaurus anectans also included Claysaurus anectans, Anatosaurus anectans, the species Saskatchewanensis, Anatosaurus Saskatchewanensis, Diclonius mirabilis, and Anatosaurus copi. So a lot of lumping there. <laughs> yeah. An even more recent lumping that happened in 2017, Heixing and others looked at the skull of Edmontosaurus regalis, and they said that Ugrinolic which was named in 2015, was Edmontosaurus. And we talk a lot more about that in episode 125. In 2020, Ryuji, Takasaki, and others agreed, but it's not clear which species it is since the fossils are from juveniles. Next up is Carithosaurus and Lambiosaurus. We cover Carithosaurus in episode 31 and Lambiosaurus in episode 148, but we'll do another quick recap because there's a lot of lumpings. So in 1975, Peter Dodson reviewed all hadrosaur species from the Old Men Formation in Alberta, Canada, which was three genera and 12 species, and after comparing skulls, found only three valid species, Carithosaurus casuarius, Lambiosaurus lambi, and Lambiosaurus magnicristatus. Dodson suggested there was sexual dimorphism in each species that you could see through the crest, but he only looked at two individuals in his study— Then Dave Evans and Robert Rees found that one of those individuals, the supposed female one, had a broken crest and just seemed smaller. And if it wasn't missing a piece of the crest, it would have been about the same size as the second individual. Twist. Yes. Then James Hobson suggested and Kenneth Carpenter agreed that Lambiosaurus lami individuals were females and Lambiosaurus magnacristatus individuals were males. But Evans and Rees said that the two species were found at different geologic levels and they did not overlap. So that brings us to Pteropelix, a dubious hadrosaur, and the fossils may actually be Corythosaurus, according to Brett Sermon in 1989, but there's no skull, so you can't be certain because you can't compare. Pteropelix lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Montana in the U.S. It was found in the Judith River Formation, and it was named by Edward Cope in 1889. The genus name means winged pelvis. There were multiple species assigned to it, but they're all based on fragments. I like that name, winged pelvis. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Other fossils thought to be pteropelix probably belong to Lambiosaurus or Gryposaurus. There's only one species now, pteropelix gralipes. That's named based on pelvic and limb bones, which are, according to Brett Sermon, quote, indistinguishable from Carithosaurus. He also said, quote, because the name has had only one specimen referred to it, it is not advisable to propose a synonymy that would cause unnecessary confusion. The name Pteropelix should be abandoned in favor of Carithosaurus. This can only be done by appeal to the ICZN, end quote. So we're waiting to see what the ICZN has to say? I think so. I couldn't find out if there was a follow-up there. 
Next is Stephanosaurus, another dubious hadrosaur. The genus name means crown lizard. Lawrence Lamb named some limbs and other fossils found in Alberta as Trachodon marginatus in 1902. Lawrence Lamb named some limbs is a fun tongue twister. <laughs> it's true. And then more hadrosaur fossils were found from the same area in the 1910s. This is the Dinosaur Park Formation, including a couple skulls. So Lamb established the species Stephanosaurus marginatus in 1914 with all of these fossils. But it wasn't clear if the bones he used to name Stephanosaurus were different enough to be a new genera. So in 1923, William Parks named Lambiosaurus lami in honor of Lawrence Lamb, who had died four years earlier, based on the two skulls and material from Stephanosaurus. Parks said that Stephanosaurus was based on undiagnostic fossils. Then there's Tetragonosaurus, a dubious Lambiosaurine that lived in the late Cretaceous and what is now North America. It was named in 1931 by Parks, and the type species is Tetragonosaurus praeceps. It was thought to be a new genus, but then it turned out the fossils that it was based on were from a juvenile Lambiosaurus. It was proposed to be a replacement name for Prochineosaurus because Prochineosaurus didn't have a species name. It was a gnomum nudum. Again, there was no type species for Prochineosaurus. It was named in 1920 by Matthew. And in 1975, Peter Dodson showed that Prochineosaurus were juvenile Lambiosaurus and Carithosaurus. He analyzed 36 skulls and then defined and documented the characters of each. And he found that the lack of a footed ischium in Prochineosaurs was a growth feature in Lambiosaurines. Mm. So Brett Sermon said that Prochineosaurus, quote, should be relegated to synonymy with Carithosaurus and Lambiosaurus. And we mentioned Prochineosaurus in episode 345 when we talk about Hippacrosaurus. So really quickly then, We've got Prochineosaurus. There's also Chineosaurus, which was really a juvenile Hippacrosaurus, and we covered that one also in episode 345. This next one's pretty interesting. Didanodon. Now, Henry Osborne mentioned this name when referring to Lawrence Lamb's Prochineosaurus altus. He referred to it as, quote, P. Dot parentheses Didanodon altus. <laughs> Weird. And that, I guess, shows that he meant quote, the name to signify either a subgenus or a taxon to be erected at full generic rank. It does not appear in the Bibliography of Fossil Vertebrates, and the only recent citation is in Steele in 1969. That's according to Brett Sermon in 1989. So this name was never republished or diagnosed or discussed, and it became a nomum nudum. Lawrence Lamb had named and described Trachodon altidens in 1902 based on a lower jaw, and then Osborne, who co-edited the paper, proposed it as this new genus, Didanodon altidens, or altus, I guess. Anyway, now it's thought to be a subadult of Lambiosaurus. That's a weird one. Mm -hmm. It's like not even really ever named in the first place. That's not the weirdest one, though, <laughs> in terms of not really being named for a hadrosaur, but that's, we'll get to that. Next is Kazakh Lambia, which was described in 1968 by Rozdesvensky as a species of Prochenosaurus convincens. The species name refers to the fact that it was the most complete fossil found on Soviet territory and proved dinosaurs could be found above the quote-unquote dinosaur horizon. Oh, interesting. So they thought there was a latitude that dinosaurs wouldn't be found north of? Mm-hmm. Kazakh Lambia was referred to Carithosaurus for a while. In 2013, Phil Bell and Kristen Brink named Kazakh Lambia. The genus name means Kazakh Lambiosaurine, and it's known from a nearly complete juvenile. Some scientists think it is synonymous with Jaxardosaurus, but others think it's a valid species. That leads me to Jaxardosaurus. It was a hadrosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Kazakhstan. It was based on a partial skull found near the Jaxart River. It was described in 1937 by Ryabanin. The type species is Jaxartosaurus aralensis. The genus name means Jaxart's lizard, and that's after the early name of the Sir Daria, a river in Central Asia. There is a second species, Jaxartosaurus fuyuensis, described in 1984 by Wu based on a dentary found in Xinjiang, China, but that one is dubious. There was no evidence of a Lambiosaurian crest, so it was assigned to Hadrosaurine. In 1968, Roj Devinsky described new skull material that he referred to Jaxartosaurus and found it to be a Lambiosaurine, similar to Carithosaurus. 
In 1989, Brett Sermon said that there should be no new species assigned to it because the type species is indeterminate and a nomum dubium. And he said that Neponosaurus is a juvenile lambiosaurine and that some considered it to be a synonym of Jaxartosaurus because Jaxartosaurus is an adult and both are from Asia. But he said that the two must be kept separate because they can't be distinguished or synonymized from one another based on morphology. Now, we've talked about Neponosaurus before in episode 180, but as a quick recap, it was a lambiosaurine hadrosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous, and the fossils found were of a juvenile in 1934. There wasn't much of a skull. It was named in 1936, based on a partial skull and skeleton, and the genus name Neponosaurus means Japanese lizard. It had a dome, which is known to be a juvenile characteristic, according to Lowell and Wright in 1942. In 1967, a humerus was found near Hashima Island that was assigned to Neponosaurus, but sometimes that one is referred to as a trachodon. Later studies didn't acknowledge this fossil. A 1994 review of Japanese dinosaurs suggested some incomplete hadrosaurs found in Asia, including Neponosaurus, may be lumped together. But Brett Sermon said, quote, the name should be retained until adult specimens are found, but as a lambiosaurine inserte sedis. Meaning unknown lambiosaur. Yeah. So it was thought to be dubious for a while, but then there were redescriptions in 2004 and 2017 that support it being a valid genus. For our next group of lumpings, we'll start with Griposaurus, which we talked about in episode 131, but here's another quick recap. Lawrence Lamb described it in 1914. The genus name means hooked nose lizard, and there's three valid species, Griposaurus notabilis, Griposaurus latidens, and Griposaurus monumentensis. Other species were found to be invalid. In 2008, Prieto Marquez agreed with Wagner that Griposaurus incurvimanus was a junior synonym of Griposaurus notabilis. In 2007, Gates and Sampson had regarded Griposaurus incurvimanus as a distinct species, but Prieto Marquez found the diagnosis to refer to characters that were not distinct or that had too much variation to be diagnostic. Then there's Critosaurus which we talked about in episode 257, but another quick recap, it was a hadrosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Patagonia, Argentina. The type species is Critosaurus navahovius. Barnum Brown found the holotype in 1904. In 1914, after Griposaurus was named, he synonymized Critosaurus and Griposaurus. In 1984, Jose Bonaparte and others named Critosaurus australis, now that species is thought to be a synonym of Cicernosaurus corneri, so that's the senior synonym, and that's because the type material was pretty much the same. In 2008, Prieto Marquez regarded Critosaurus australis as a junior synonym of Cicernosaurus corneri based on iliac and pubic characters. Horner and Weishampel in 1990 had separated Griposaurus from Critosaurus because of uncertainty around the skull. In 1992, Horner described two skulls from New Mexico that he said were Critosaurus and showed them to be different from Griposaurus. In 1993, Adrian Hunt and Spencer Lucas named those skulls as two new genera, Anasazisaurus and Nashoibitosaurus. In 2013, Prieto Marquez found Nashoibitosaurus to be distinct, but that Anasazisaurus was a synonym of Critosaurus, but kept it as a distinct species, Critosaurus horneri. There was a partial skeleton found in the Sabinas Basin in Mexico by Jim Kirkland and others, but Prieto Marquez in 2013 found that to be an indeterminate saurolophene. Anasazisaurus lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now New Mexico in the U.S. in the Kirtland Formation. It was first described as Critosaurus by Jack Horner, who described the skull in 1992, as I mentioned, and it had this short nasal crest that stuck out in between and above its eyes. This crest was unique because it was roughened. It was named in 1993 by Adrian Hunt and Spencer Lucas, and the type species is Anasazisaurus horneri, named in honor of Jack Horner. Anasazi is a Navajo word that means enemy ancestors. The fossils were found in the 1970s by a field party from Brigham Young University. Horner originally said the skull was Critosaurus navajovius, but Hunt and Lucas said that the holotype of Critosaurus was undiagnostic and a nomum dubium, and they named Anasazisaurus, but not everyone agreed. In 2014, Prieto Marquez said the two were similar, but that it was distinct enough to be a valid species of Critosaurus as Critosaurus horneri. The skull was not well preserved, so not everyone agrees with 
Anasazisaurus being its own species. Then there's Cicernosaurus, a hadrosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Argentina. It's thought to be the only hadrosaur from Gondwana until Wheelie Nakake was discovered in 2011. The fossils of Cicernosaurus were found in 1923 by a team from the Field Museum. They found a partial juvenile skeleton, and then it was described in 1979 by Brett Sermon. The type species is Cicernosaurus corneri, and the genus name means severed lizard. That name refers to it living in Gondwana when most hadrosaurs lived in Laurasia. It's named because of the unique morphology of the ilium and the fact that it doesn't look like other hadrosaurids except Gilmoresaurus. Brett Sermon said in 1989 that he regarded Cicernosaurus as hadrosaurine incertacetus because of a lack of diagnostic skull material. In 1984, Bonaparte and others named referred fossils found between 1982 and 1986 in the Los Alamitos formation as Critosaurus australis, based on the pelvis and dentary. They compared the fossils to Cicernosaurus and found no big differences between the two, but said Critosaurus was valid because of a more triangular process on the ilium. Wagner found Critosaurus australis to be distinct, but referred to it as Cicernosaurus australis, and it was distinct because of the differences in the area and time when they lived. Salinas and others in 2006 said Critosaurus australis was closely related to Telmatosaurus transylvanicus. Prieto Marquez reanalyzed the fossils and then in 2008 said Cicernosaurus and Critosaurus should be synonymized. Next is Wheelie Nakake, which was named by Valiari and others in 2010-2011. The type species is Wheelie Nakake salitralensis, and the genus name means southern duck mimic in Mapuche. The species name refers to the salitral in Rio Negro province. Disarticulated specimens of juveniles and adults were found at the Salitral Moreno site of the Allen Formation, and then more specimens were found at a second site in the Malvinas Argentinas Partido. Some fossils may be from a Patagonian lambiosaurine. In 2016, Cruzado, Caballero, and Curia said that the fossils may be more than one genera of hadrosaurid and that the holotype was too weathered and incomplete to support its diagnosis, so it's a gnomum vanum, which is basically a gnomum duvium. I haven't heard that one before. When I looked it up, uh, one of the definitions said it's kind of a useless term. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make gnomum vanum a gnomum vanum? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know how it works exactly. <laughs> so in 2017, Cruzado, Caballero, and Powell assigned the paratype of Wilinakake to be... Bonapartosaurus rionegrensis. This next dinosaur was named a lot longer ago. One of the oldies. One of the old. They're all oldies, but yeah. It's Orthomerus, which lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now the Netherlands. It was named by Harry Seeley in 1883, so it has been a while. And the type species is Orthomerus doloi. The genus name means straight femur, and the species name is in honor of the paleontologist Louis Dolo, who had found the fossils in August 1882 when visiting London. It's pretty fun. You're just on a trip and you find some fossils. Yeah. <laughs> he found a partial juvenile, including femora. And then in 1871, Selly referred to a left tibia and metatarsal to Orthomerus. More fragments have been found, some from Belgium. They're not all necessarily Orthomerus. Dolo acquired two tail vertebrae in 1882, but it's hard to know if they were actually Orthomerus. There's a second species, Orthomerus weberi, which was named in 1945 by Ryabinin based on hind limb elements found in what is now Ukraine. They were found by Weber, which is how he got the species name. Weber is a female, so in 1995, that name was amended to Orthomerus weberi. In 2015, it was made the type species of Ryabinino hadros, which was formally named in 2020. A third species, Orthomerus transylvanicus, is actually Telmatosaurus transylvanicus. In 1915, Franz Nopsha had referred it to Orthomerus. And we talk a lot about Telmatosaurus in episode 277, if you want to go back to that one for more details. A fourth species, Orthomerus hilii, 
was originally named by Newton in 1892 as Iguanodon hilii, and then renamed by Nopsha in 1915. It's based on a tooth fragment and seen as a nomum dubium. Brett Sermon said Orthomerus doloi was a nomum dubium because it wasn't a complete enough specimen, and that Orthomerus transylvanicus should be tomatosaurus. So Orthomerus was considered a nomum dubium by Brinkman in 1888 and Horner and others in 2004 as well. In 2019, it was found that Orthomerus had no unique characteristics. They did a study, and then they made the right thigh bone the lectotype, and that would make Orthomerus a nomum dubium. It's also possible Orthomerus is outside of Hadrosauridae and could be a more basal hadrosauroid. Kind of linked to that one is Hectosaurus, named by Nopska as Limnosaurus in 1899, but then it was named Hectosaurus in 1910 by Barnum Brown. The type species is Hectosaurus transylvanicus, but it's now known as Tomatosaurus, which again we talk about in episode 277. Moving on to our next group, we've got Keonidin, a dubious hadrosaurid that lived in the late Cretaceous. The type species is Keonidin arctatus, and the genus name means column tooth. It was found in Colorado in the U.S. in the Laramie Formation in 1873, and it's named based on fragments. There's two other species, Keonidin kaisilcumensis, named by Ryabinin in 1931. The vertebrae was found in Uzbekistan and Keonidin stenosis, named by Cope in 1875, found in Alberta, Canada in the Frenchman Formation. Both are probably hadrosaurs, but it's very fragmentary material. Keonidin kaisilcumensis has been reclassified as Bactrosaurus kaisilcumensis. Now, Bactrosaurus we talked about in episode 171, but as a quick recap, in 1998, Pascal Godefroy and others described the newly found Bactrosaurus fossils, and they said that the skull material from the Irandabasu formation was Gilmoresaurus. And they said that Bactrosaurus was not a lambiosaur or even a hadrosaurid, but instead a more primitive hadrosauroid. We keep mentioning Gilmoresaurus. So Gilmoresaurus was either a hadrosaur or a guanodont that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Inner Mongolia in the Irandabasu formation. It was named in 1979 by Brett Sermon in honor of Gilmore. The type species is Gilmoresaurus mongoliensis, and the genus name means Gilmore's lizard, because, again, for Charles W. Gilmore. Other species have been named. There's Gilmoresaurus atavus, found in Uzbekistan, and Gilmoresaurus arhangeskiel, found in the Bisecti formation. But those are too fragmentary, so both species are considered dubious. There's another species from the Bisecti formation named Gilmoresaurus kaisilcumensis, but it has been referred to Bactrosaurus. Next is Manchurosaurus, which was a hadrosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now China. It was found in 1914 on the banks of the Amur River. It's the first dinosaur named from China. It's named in 1925 by Ryabinin. The holotype material was initially referred to Dracodon. The type species is Manchurosaurus Amarensis, and the genus name means lizard from Manchuria. Brett Sermon said that it was part iguanodont and part hadrosaurine, and that hadrosaurs had originated in Asia, and he also said that more fossils needed to be studied. In 1979, Brett Sermon thought that it was a nomum dubium, but some scientists later thought that it was valid. In 1981, Osmolska and Marianska said that the Irindavasu dinosaurs were not all one species and tentatively assigned material to Tanius. In 1985, Horner and Weishampel re-examined the fossils, including fossils Gilmore had not described, and referred some fossils to Bactrosaurus and said that the skull material was Gilmoresaurus. Then Horner and others in 2004 said that Manchurosaurus was Nomum dubium. In 2010, Albert Prieto Marquez and Mark Norell re-described Gilmoresaurus and found that the two Irandavasu hadrosaurs were different enough to be their own taxon. There's three species named Manchurosaurus amarensis, Manchurosaurus mongoliensis, that Brett Sermon had named Gilmoresaurus, and Manchurosaurus lausensis, which is actually a nomum dubium. There's a skeleton on display at the Central Geological and Prospecting Museum in St. Petersburg, but it's pretty incomplete, so a lot of that skeleton is plaster. He mentioned Tanius, so Tanius was named in 1929 by Carl Wyman, 
The type species is Tanius sinensis, and it's named based on disarticulated and unassociated fossils. In 1958, Young referred pelvic material. He also referred the species Tanius chinkonkoensis that is close to Gilmore source. So in 1958, Young found a referred skull that was like a hadrosaurine, but it also had proportionately taller neural spines similar to lambiosaurines. Brett Sermon said that Tanius was a hadrosaurine in Certacetus. The genus name Tanius means of tan. <laughs> it's real tan, is it? <laughs> it's because of the paleontologist Tan Shicho. Mm. It's in honor of tan. It's a hadrosauroid, lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now China. It was estimated to be 23 feet or 7 meters long and weighed 2 tons. In 1939, Ryabanin named Tanius prinidae, which was later assigned to Bactrosaurus. In 1958, Yang Zhongjian named Tanius chinkankuensis, and then in 1976, Jun Shonan named Tanius lyangensis, but later both were found to be junior synonyms of Tsintausaurus. Then in 2017, Jang and others found Tanius sinensis and Tanius chinkankuensis to be valid Tanius, but that Tanius lyangensis was not valid. We've got another grouping of dinosaurs here, starting with Juchungosaurus. Fossils were found in Shandong, China, including skull bones, limb bones, and vertebrae, and it was named in 2007 by Zhao and others, but it was later found to represent different growth stages of Shantungsaurus. So Shantungsaurus, we talked about in episode 89, but as a quick recap, lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now China. It was very large. It had a femur that was 5.6 feet or 1.7 meters long, and a humerus that was about 3 feet or 1 meters long. There's a composite skeleton at the Geological Institute of China in Beijing, and that's 48 feet or 14.7 meters long. Wow, that's that's pretty big. Yeah, and it's estimated to weigh up to 16 tons. It's about as big as hadrosaurs got. Yeah. It was described in 1973 by Hu Chengzhi, and the genus name means Shandong lizard. Five skeletons were found, and Xu Xing and others said that Shantungosaurus is similar to Edmontosaurus. Then there's Hua Xiaosaurus, which was named in 2011 by Zhao and others. The full name is Hua Xiaosaurus aigatens. The genus name is the ancient word for China, and the species name is Latin for giganteus. And in Chinese, that same word is juda. Hua Xiaosaurus was found to be a junior synonym of Shantungosaurus due to individual variation and some distortion on how the fossils were buried. Next is Arstanosaurus, a hadrosauroid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Kazakhstan. The fossils were based on a partial left maxilla and part of a left femur. It was named in 1982 by Shilin and Suslov, and the genus name means Arstan lizard. It's confusing because it has been thought to be a hadrosaurid and a ceratopsid. In the mid-90s, mid-1990s, that is, it was thought to be a ceratopsid. Then it was later found that the characters that were thought to make it unique were just based on perspective, and the maxilla came from something like Bactrosaurus, and the femur wasn't enough to specify what it was, so it became an indeterminate hadrosaurid. There's a hadrosaurid from the bayan Sharif formation that's sometimes been thought to be Arstanosaurus, but now it's thought to be its own genus, and it's informally known as Gadolosaurus. Next is Batyrosaurus, a hadrosauroid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Kazakhstan. The type species is Batyrosaurus rojasvenskii. It was described in 2012 by Pascal Goldfroy and others. The genus name came from Batyr, the Kazakh hero warriors, and the species name is in honor of the paleontologist Rojasvensky. But it may be the same as Arstanosaurus akurganensis. Back to Gadolosaurus. Gadolosaurus has no type designated. Huh. That doesn't make a lot of sense. This is, uh, I would say, the weirdest hadrosaur <laughs> name that I came across. The name means baby dinosaur. It's a Japanese phonetization of the Cyrillic spelling of hadrosaur. And it was meant to be a placeholder name. The name was in a 1979 popular book by Saito about a Russian exhibit of dinosaurs that toured Japan. According to a letter in 1985 by Kurzanov, it was from the bayan Shire Formation, but Kurzanov thought it was a juvenile Arstanosaurus. It's about 30 inches or 71 centimeters high. 
The figures in the book in 1979 show it to be more like an iguanodontid than a hadrosaurid, but those features were plaster reconstructions. Brett Sermon said that Norman, Osmolska, and Serino said that they all considered Gadolosaurus to be a juvenile Arstenosaurus. And Brett Sermon said it shouldn't be cited until more specimens are described, and it should be as a new name, since Arstanosaurus is a nomum dubium. Yeah, probably shouldn't use a name that's never actually been a name in the first place. Yep, but it's pretty funny. It was in a book. Can't believe everything you read in books. Peer-reviewed journals are better. <laughs> Some books are peer-reviewed. Yeah, and our books are good. <laughs> <laughs> As well as any books that are advertisers, they're also very good. Mm. And no, we didn't have to say that. <laughs> now, the rest of the hadrosaurs that we'll be covering that I've found at least are not as connected or they don't really have as many connections to other hadrosaurs. So we'll just go through these alphabetically. We'll start with Ashenosaurus, which lived in the late Cretaceous, and it's named based on fossilized fragments thought to be hadrosaur jaw fragments. The genus name means Ashen lizard for the Ashen formation where the fossils were found, and it's estimated to be between 13 to 16.4 feet or 4 to 5 meters long. Starting with another little one, or maybe <laughs> medium little. Yeah. The fossils were found in 1887 and named by Gerard Smets in 1888. The type species is Ashenosaurus multidens. Now, Smet said that he examined these fossils with his naked eye, with magnifying lenses, and a microscope. But then, Louis Dolo found the fossils to be fossil wood and not a dinosaur. Oh, no. Smets tried to defend it, but then he was embarrassed. There were rumors that he stopped being a scientist, but then he published his next paper in 1889 about turtles. Turtles save the day again. <laughs> As long as they can avoid getting stepped on by sword I bites. don't know about saving the day. <laughs> he wasn't confident enough for the dinosaurs, so he moved on to turtles. Oh, I see. The lesser of the animal groups. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that there was a length estimate from a piece of wood. It's pretty funny. Yeah, the whole thing's pretty funny. <laughs> Next, there's Augustan Olifus, which we talked about in episode 156. It's the California state dinosaur, described in 2013. It was originally described as Sorolophus morisei, and then later studies found its skull to be different from other Sorolophines, and it became its own genus. And then it became the state dinosaur. Yes, it's a good path. Next, we've got Calor orinkus, which was named by Cope in 1892, and that genus name means broken beak. It was based on broken bones found around the snout. It's been thought to be a hadrosaurid and a ceratopsid, and sometimes a triceratops. Cope thought that it was an agathalmid, a ceratopsid, from the Laramie Formation in Colorado. Then he thought it was a hadrosaurid. And then in 1904, Franz Nopsha reclassified it as a ceratopsid. In the 1940s, Richard Swan Lowell and Nelda Wright said that it was a dubious hadrosaurid. And then Brett Sermon in 1979 said that it was likely a ceratopsid neck frill, probably triceratops. Other reviews found it to be an indeterminate hadrosaurid. Next is Discanus, which lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Montana, found in the Judith River Formation. It was named by Cope in 1876, and the type species is Discanus incostus. The genus name means rough enamel. There are four species that were named based on isolated teeth of what turned out to be hadrosaurids and ceratopsians. And each of these species had between one to eight teeth. <laughs> the species include Discanus Incostus, Discanus bicarinatus, Discanus paganus, and Discanus haydenianus. Franz Nopsha in 1901 assigned it to be a ceratopsid, and in 1907, John Hatcher redescribed the teeth and found them to be hadrosaurid and ceratopsid teeth. All mixed up. It's really hard to name dinosaurs based on teeth. Yes, it is not recommended. Next, we've got Glashades. It's a hadrosauroid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Montana, found in the Two Medicine Formation. I like that name. Yeah. The type species is Glashades ericsoni, and the genus name means concealed in mud. It combines the Latin word for mud with the Greek god Hades. It was named because the fossils were beneath the surface. Prieto Marquez found it to be a non-hadrosaurid hadrosauroid. 
In 2012, Campione and others said that the holotype may be an indeterminate juvenile sorolophene hadrosaurid and that Glashades ericsoni is a nomum dubium. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> yeah, it's a good name. Next, we've got Gongpo Chuansaurus, a basal hadrosauroid that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Gansu Province, China. The genus name means Gongpo Chuan Reptile. It was first described in 1997 by Liu Junchang as Probactrosaurus mazong shanensis. Later that year, it was found to be less derived than the type species of Probactrosaurus, so the name Gongpo Chuansaurus was suggested informally, and then it was named formally in 2014 by Liu Junchang. Then we've got Hypsobema, which we talked about in episode 269, but as a quick recap, it was originally called Neosaurus Missouriensis, and then renamed later in 1945 by Gilmore and Stewart to Parasaurus Missouriensis because the name Neosaurus was already the name for a synapsid. It was thought to be a sauropod, but Gilmore thought it was either a hadrosaur or a sauropod, and then Gilmore said that it couldn't be a hadrosaur because of the chevrons and, quote, more elongate centra. Then there were more excavations in the late 1980s and they found parts of the jaw. So it's still valid? Yes, and Hypsobema missouriensis is the official state dinosaur of Missouri. That's why I was wondering, because I thought it was <laughs> recognized in such a way that if it became a nomen dubium, that's a little unfortunate. Nah, but it's included here because of the namings with Neosaurus and Parasaurus. Gotcha. Next is Cutalisaurus. The type species is Cutalisaurus colerorum. The genus name means spoon lizard and refers to the shape of the dentary. It's named based on a right dentary. It was named in 2006 by Prieto Marquez and others, and that's based on this dentary having a long section with no teeth. They said it may be synonymized in the future. They also said in 2006 they chose to split it out because it was, quote, as susceptible to error as lumping IPS SRA27 and the remaining material into one taxon. Now, the fossils were found in the 1990s in the Talarn Formation. The site was later named Layaus. In 1997, Casanovas, Codeas, and others said that the fossil was from the SRA, where the original Pararabdodon fossils were found. In 1998, they described it and referred it to Pararabdodon isonensis, which was originally Iguanodontia in Cerdecetis by Casanovas and Codeas and others in 1993. Then, Prieto Marquez and others reevaluated and said that the fossil was found 30 feet or 9 meters below the SRA locality and that no dentary was found in the SRA locality to compare. So they said that the Parabdodon fossils only came from the original locality. In 2009, Xavier Pereda, Superbiola, and others said it, quote, exemplifies the problem of erecting new species on the basis of very fragmentary material, end quote, and it being a valid genus depends on finding more fossils. In 2009, Prieto Marquez and Wagner looked at the holotype of Cutalisaurus and compared it to Cintausaurus spinorhinus. They found the dentary to have the same long toothless slope at the front of the jaw. And they also found similarities between Parabdodon isonensis and Cintausaurus spinorhinus. And since both Parabdodon and Cutalisaurus came from the same formation, they decided to lump the two together. Then in 2013, Prieto Marquez and others found in a study of hadrosaurs from Europe that the dentary wasn't that unique. It just looked more unique because of the way it was first prepared in the 1990s. The Cintausaurus dentary was also distorted from its preparation. Now, because of this, the Cutalisaurus dentary is not distinguishable from many other Lambiosaurines and is not connected to Cintausaurus, so it's now considered to be an indeterminate Lambiosaurine dentary. Next is Kundurosaurus, which lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Russia. A partial skull and nearly complete brain case was found, and there's referred specimens that include partial brain cases, dentaries, humeri, ulna, radius, pelvic girdle, and more. It was described in 2012 by Pascal Godfroy and others, and the type species is Kundurosaurus nagornii. The genus name comes from Kundor, the type locality, and the species name is in honor of V.A. Nagorni who found the locality in 1990. Shing and others in 2014 considered Kundorosaurus nagornii to be a junior synonym of Kerberosaurus monachini, a sorolophene hadrosaur, based on it being in the same formation and having similar characters. Gopher and others in 2012, though, said that they were separate. 
Then we've got Microhadrosaurus, which was a hadrosaurid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Guangdong, China, in the Yuan Pu Formation. It was estimated to be 8.5 feet or 2.6 meters long. Oh, that is micro. <laughs> It was named in 1979 by Dong, who said it was like Edmontosaurus. The type species is Microhadrosaurus nanshungensis. The genus name means small, sturdy lizard. They found a partial left mandible of a juvenile. There's no distinguishing characteristics. Brett Sermon said, quote, the use of juveniles as holotypes should be avoided, end quote, because the skulls and the teeth, teeth in terms of number and proportion, they change a lot during growth stages. So Brett Sermon said that this was a nomum dubium. Lots of things are named based on juveniles. It's not always a bad thing. Yes. Well, the lumpings and the splittings continue. <laughs> yeah. Then we've got Nodoceratops. The type species is Nodoceratops bonarellii. It was found and named in 1918 by Augusto Tapia. The genus name means southern lizard face, and the species name is in honor of Guido Bonarelli, who advised Tapia in his studies. The original fossil has unfortunately been lost. It was a toothless jaw. It was thought to be a ceratopsian. Makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense why it was named Nodoceratops. Yeah. There's a lot of mix-ups between hadrosaurs and ceratopsians. I guess they had similar teeth. <laughs> so in 1980, Molnar said it was a hadrosaurid because ceratopsians weren't found in South America, but not everyone agreed with this reasoning. And some scientists said it should be considered a ceratopsian unless shown otherwise through morphology. But if we don't have the fossils anymore, does it really matter? You just have to find more fossils mm -hmm. from the same area. Next is Ornithotarsus, which lived in the Cretaceous. The holotype includes the lower part of the left calf bone and part of the left shin. It's estimated to be between 46 and 49 feet, or 14 to 15 meters long, and weigh 12 tons. Nice. That's like Shantungosaurus size almost. Yeah, it's a big one. And the lower part of the shin is 18 inches or 46 centimeters wide. Samuel Lockwood found the fossil in 1869 while walking along Union Beach in New Jersey. And he saw a bone coming out of a wall of dirt, the shin and fibula. So the exact location of where the holotype was found is unknown. But he told Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins about the fossils, and then Hawkins sent him a sketch. And this helped Hawkins figure out the details of the ankle structure of hadrosaurs. Hawkins was working on the Central Park Museum in New York City at the time. Marsh asked to purchase the fossils, and Lockwood agreed, but he wanted enough time to make this cast for Hawkins. Then Cope came to Lockwood, because we're in Bone Wars time, and he asked to buy the fossils. Lockwood said no, but he did let Cope draw them, and then he apologized to Marsh later in a letter because, well, Marsh acquired the fossils in 1886 for Yale Peabody Museum, and he did have a cast. Cope named the new species before Marsh. So he named the species in 1869. Cope did, that is. It's named based on a partial hind limb. The type species is Ornithotarsus imanis. The genus name means Tarsus bird, or, you know, bird's ankle, and refers to the tibia and ankle bone fusing the way it does in birds. And the species name means the immense one. Hmm, that's good. Cope thought it was part of Symphipoda, which is a group that he said were reptiles with deformed ankles that also included Compsognathus. Compsognathus. Some researchers considered Ornithotarsus to be a junior synonym of Hadrosaurus foci. I think it might be Hadrosaurus folkii. I've heard that one both ways, which is weird because usually when you end with I, you have the I sound, but since yeah. it's double I, it's kind of weird. Yeah. It might also be because it's such a famous one that's been around for so long that maybe it got simplified more than some of the other ones did. Yeah, could be. So it only would be a junior synonym, assuming that the fossils of Ornithotarsus were found in the Woodbury Formation in New Jersey. But again, we don't know exactly where they were found. There's a lack of diagnostic features, so it was found to be in Nomum dubium. In 1977, Bard and Horner suggested Ornithotarsus and Hadrosaurus foci, or foci, to be synonymous, but that's based on biogeography, and there's not enough material to know for sure. In 2006, Prieto Marquez said that it was a Nomum dubium. And now we're on to our last Hadrosaur of this segment, Pneumatoarthus. And congrats for sticking with us for this long. <laughs> you're still here. <laughs> so the type species is Pneumatoarthus pylorus. 
It was found in New Jersey, the Mount Laurel Formation. Joseph Lady in 1865 thought the holotype was a hadrosaurus sacrum, he said so in his monograph, but it was named by Cope in 1870. Cope later said it was a dinosaur more closely related to Ankysaurus ephrasia and Klepsisaurus. In 1872, Cope described a sea turtle. I've got sea turtles and ceratopsians hmm. coming up a lot here. Protostega. And he said that Pneumatoarthus was also a sea turtle. He said the same thing in his 1875 monograph on Cretaceous vertebrate fossils from the Western interior. Later scientists thought Pneumatoarthus was a theropod or a hadrosaur. Hewn in 1932 said it was the sacral vertebrae of Dryptosaurus. Barden Horner in 1977 transferred it to Testudinata, which are tetrapods with a true turtle shell, and said it was a sea turtle. Brett Sermon agreed and said that it should not be considered to be a hadrosaurid. So now we have gotten through 50 plus hadrosaur lumpings and splittings. That was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> I went through a lot of different source material, but I just want to point out three in particular that were really helpful if you want to read these yourselves, if you want to dive even deeper into hadrosaurs, because they go into more than just lumpings and splittings. There's a revision of the Hadrosauridae, Reptilia, Ornithischia, and their evolution during the Campanian and Maastrichtian by Michael Keith Brett Sermon. That was his dissertation for George Washington University in 1989. There's also Phylogeny and Historical Biogeography of Hadrosaur Dinosaurs by Albert Prieto Marquez. That was his dissertation for Florida State University in 2008. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the segment, there's the book Hadrosaur's Life of the Past, published in 2014, which is a compilation of the 50-plus presentations of that International Hadrosaur Symposium in 2014. Nice. And uh, our fun fact slash one news item of the day. <laughs> More hadrosaurs. Yes. Well, it's just one hadrosaur. Mm. Really slowing things down a notch. It's a gnarly one, though. It is. And it is the first South American hadrosaurid described with pathologies. It was written by Penelope Cruzado Caballero and others and published in Cretaceous Research just recently. Another name that came up in my hadrosaur research. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Mentioned her a few times. This time... They're talking about an injured Bonapartosaurus, which was located at the Museo Provincial Carlos Ameguino, also known as MPCA, in Rio Negro, Argentina. It was collected way back in 1984 in the same province, and this is actually the holotype specimen of Bonapartosaurus. Nice. Oh, but poor specimen when it lived. Because it has pathologies? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're not the worst pathologies that I've ever seen. Some of the headlines for this were really made me feel bad yeah, for this dinosaur. <laughs> they're probably playing it up more than they should have, mm. is my guess. But it is, like I said, the first South American hadrosaurid with pathologies, so it is very important. They looked at three paleopathologies that they found on this Bonapartosaurus, and there are two in separate neural spines of vertebrae from the middle of the tail. So the top middle of the tail had a couple, a pair of bones that each had their own pathology. Then there's also one in its metatarsal in the left foot. So a middle foot bone that was also injured. Hmm. In one tail vertebra, there's a quote unquote displaced fracture, which basically means it's bent to the side. That's what it looks like. Hmm. And when they CT scanned it, you can see a break inside the bone at that bent area. Ooh. So they think what happened is there was an impact or other huge force that caused a bunch of stress on that bone. It broke it and bent it, and then it sort of healed in that bent shape afterwards. <laughs> I wonder if that was, made it harder to function. It did. I will get into that. Oh, okay. <laughs> the other tail vertebra has a mostly healed fracture. It looks like to me, someone glued part of a ball, like if you sliced maybe the edge of a ball off and like glued it to the side of the bone. Mm -hmm. But again, this is the neural spine. So it's a pretty thin bone usually, but there's like a weird sphere sticking out of it. And they're not exactly sure what caused that injury. They don't think it was the same impact as the other vertebra, but it has a growth on it. And then for the toe bone, there's a growth over what is probably an osteosarcoma also known as a tumor. Oh. 
It covers about two thirds of the foot bone.、Oh. So, yeah, basically, if you think of a typical toe bone, it's like a lot of bones where it's wider at the ends, where they articulate to the other bones, and that sort of narrows down in the middle. So it has a little bit of an hourglass shape. But since it's all swollen and puffed out from the pathology, it's about as wide in the middle as it is on the ends. And since that wide part is two thirds of the length of it, there's just like the ends, a little tiny dip, and then this big, rough, pitted growth in between the two that sort of keeps it the same width. But the other toe bones are fine, or the other foot bones, I should say. It's a foot bone, not a toe bone. Yeah, but it's still two thirds. I don't know if those headlines were exaggerating. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, it's bad on that foot bone, but. That foot bone isn't necessarily a weight bearing bone because it's the outer foot bone.、Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it would normally bear some weight, but it's got other foot bones that it can sort of lean over onto. And it, it wasn't necessarily like a traumatic injury. It could just be some type of infection or something that it had healed from or otherwise survived through. So it's not really hindering it in a major way where it、mm -hmm. died. They even mentioned if it had actually broken the bone or if it had this sort of injury on, say, its femur, that would be a big deal. But on this one foot bone, it's not the end of the world. So, as the authors put it, quote, the suite of vertebral pathologies would have generated pain and discomfort during its daily activity. Yeah,、so、that's, quote, that's no way to live. With pain and discomfort, lots of people live with pain and discomfort nobody, in their vertebrae. Nobody likes it. Oh no, no, they don't. But I'm just thinking, compared to some of the other paleopathologies we've talked about, where like bones telescope together from、Ooh. massive trauma and all sorts of things like that, this is not one of the worst. I would say. Okay, that's true. <laughs> so these researchers tried to piece together how the injuries would affect the day-to-day -day life, and when it came to those injuries in the vertebrae, they think that. It might have impacted its tail mobility. So specifically, since it was injured in the middle of the tail, it might have been there because the base of the tail is supported by more muscles. The caudofemoralis, especially, they say, sort of terminates part way down the tail, and this might be shortly after that tail muscle attachment point, and it could have resulted from. Increased stress from that lack of support if something hit it at that point.、Mm. And that impact could have been by tons of different things. It might have been from mating trauma, trampling, aggressive rivalry, or also an attack by a predator. Really, just anything that could hit it hard. Yeah, I probably could turn too fast and hit a tree. I know someone that broke their arm like that.、Ooh. So, and you got to be careful when you've got these long appendages sticking out. <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking from experience. <laughs> no, I'm not. Fortunately. <laughs> You just waved your long arm as you said that. So oh I yeah, was wondering. Yeah, I've never hurt my arm, at least that bad. As far as the foot tumor goes, they say it probably would have slowed it down, and the injury may have affected the ankle and maybe even the knee, depending on which muscles attached to that foot bone. But since it's the inner part of the foot that was injured, it might have adjusted its gait to compensate, and so that means it probably could have adjusted its gait to compensate. Especially since it appears that it healed pretty significantly, so it didn't just die right after the injury happened. But it may have affected its behavior in some ways. They wanted to talk about the relationship between the injured Bonapartosaurus and other Bonapartosaurus, as well as with other species and the environment. But they couldn't really get too much detail out of it、mm -hmm. because it's like we don't know. Maybe if you've got a limping dinosaur, it's going to be harder to find a mate, or it might be a little harder to. Get enough food throughout the day, or something like that, but we just don't know for sure. Right? There aren't any smoking guns for the cause of its death, but we don't think that it was from the injuries because, again, they're mostly healed, and it seems like it wasn't in a really bad way with any of those specific injuries. It just lived through some pain for a while. Yep, that's how it goes when you don't have doctor, no dinosaur doctors. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and that wraps up this hadrosaur tastic. 350th episode. Thanks for listening and for sticking with us for 350. We're looking forward to the next 350, right, Garrett? Yes. If you want to join our growing community, talk about dinosaur news, more hadrosaurs if you want to, <laughs> or you could talk about a different dinosaur if this was enough hadrosaurs for a while. Right. There are lots of others <laughs> with our Discord. Then go to our page at patreon.com/slash/inodino. Thanks again, and until next time.